Hello everyone and welcome to All Saints Connect. It's great to have you joining in today. We can't meet together in a common location, but we can set aside this common time slot to focus ourselves today on the promises of God and to keep training ourselves in following King Jesus as we wait for his kingdom to come. Speaking of waiting, some of you have been kindly asking after the Barrett family as we await the arrival of Barrett baby number three, who is due any day. I can tell you that at the time of recording this, uh, we are still waiting, but by the time you watch this, things may have changed. We'll keep you posted. Today, we're gonna to dive into a new series of studies on the book of Hebrews, chapters one to 10. Hebrews is a juicy part of the New Testament, originally written to a bunch of Christians who were under pressure, who were in danger of drifting off and retreating to safety. And that temptation is still there for us, isn't it? And so I'm looking forward to being encouraged today to press on with confidence. If you haven't already, you can grab a copy of the Bible study guide for this sermon series from the All Saints website after the service. Or if you're passing by the church building, you can grab a printed copy from uh, next to the side door of the church building. As we get into this training session today, can I encourage you to grab your Bible and to clear away distractions? Be ready to join in, not as an observer, but as a participant. Take a deep breath and let's get ready to sing our first song in which we call on ourselves to give God the praise that he's worthy of every day. Let's sing.
your looking eyes, listening ears, and learning hearts. Yeah! I love this song, Gordy. Turn down the music. It's not that big a deal when oh. you make an apology. <laughs> yeah. Now, what are you sorry for, Gordy? Well, last week I said only mums can cut with scissors. Oh, dads I remember. Can too, so sorry to the dad. Sorry, dad. But mums are the best at it. <laughs> mums are the best cutters. Yeah. Oh, okay. Hey, Beth. Yes. Are you good at big words? Well, I'm. I can't spell big words, but I'm pretty good at describing big words. Oh, there's a new memory verse we've got. Oh, yeah, there is. It's got huge words. Does in it? it? Does it? Yeah. <laughs> Having a bit of trouble? Reckon. What are they? Well, like superior and ancestor. Oh. And various. Oh. And appointed <laughs> and okay. Wait. 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 Representation. Wait. I've got my hand in your face. Oh. We're, we're home. Shall right. we go in and have a look at the verse? All right. I okay. Need some help. All right. Let's do that. Let's go. Okay, Gordy, now we're back. Let's look at those words together again. Okay, start with superior. Oh, superior means it's better than everyone else. Well, like Dave. Yes, like Dave. Yeah. 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 All right, uh, what about ancestors? <laughs> ancestors are the people that have come before you in your family. Yeah, like the oldies. Like the oldies in your family. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, how about, what does various mean? Various means uh, lots of different kinds. Mm, okay, and and appointed heir. Oh, that's a hard one. An appointed heir, kind of like the person chosen to be the next in line. So maybe the next king or someone important. Oh, so that's more like me. More like you. Yeah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, what about radiance? Radiance is like when something is almost glowing out of you so it's someone who is radiating joy but it feels like everything they say and everything they do is is bringing joy and that's like you oh it's like me thanks Gordy. <laughs> what about exact representation oh exact representation just means like it's exactly the same oh that's easy what about sustaining sustaining keeping going and purification of sins. Purification of sins. This is a huge verse. I know. Purification of sins is what Jesus did for us. He took our sins away when he died on the cross and rose again, and he made us pure. Okay, well, I'm pretty sure I've got it all now. Good. Shall we read the verse out that's going to be the memory verse? Yeah, okay. Would, you, would it, you like to do that? Yeah, yeah, but it's pretty big. That's okay. All we'll right. Go. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom also he made the universe. The son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. 
after he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. Man, oh. this is crazy long. <laughs> That's really long. It's so long. <laughs> But kids, you're not going to be doing all of that for your memory verse, so don't worry. Oh, phew! Yeah. So, Gordy, if we were going to say that verse in our own words, shall we have a go at that? Yeah, I think you better have a go at all that. All right, I'll have a go. Everyone at home, it's going to be on your screen. God used to speak to your families through the prophets, but now he has spoken through Jesus. Jesus is the most important one in all creation and Jesus was there to create the universe with God. Jesus showed us exactly what God was like and he kept things going just by speaking. After he died for us on the cross and rose again, he went to be with God in heaven and sits right by him in the most important spot. Oh, that makes so much sense, Buff. It does, doesn't it? It helps to put things in your own words sometimes. It's like the new international version of Buff and Cordy. Yes, we've kind of created our own version, but we didn't change it. We just made it make more sense to us. I get it, Al. Mm. Anyway, we hope that was helpful for you guys today. Now we're going to go to the memory verse. So kids, jump up because my family's going to teach you something and you have to repeat it after her. It's Hebrews chapter 1 verse 1 and 2 and 2 It's Hebrews chapter 1 verse 1 and 2 In the past God spoke to our ancestors In the past God spoke to our ancestors Through the prophets Through the prophets at many times and in many ways, at many times and in many ways, but in these last days he has spoken to us, in these last days he has spoken to us by his son. It's Hebrews chapter 1 verse 1 and 2. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 1 and 2 We come now to read the Bible. And after the readings, Anthony Bramble is going to begin our sermon series on Hebrews. Let's pray as we come to God's word together. Holy Spirit, you inspired the prophets and the apostles so that their human words spoke the message of God. And so we ask that just as you inspired the writing of the scriptures, that you would illuminate them to us now 
as we read them. Will you soften our hearts and sharpen our minds? Please breathe the truth into us today so that we perceive afresh the majesty of Christ and live for the glory of our Heavenly Father. Amen. Hey guys, I'm going to be bringing you one of our Bible readings tonight. This is from Psalm 45. For the director of music, to the tune of lilies, of the sons of Korah, a mascal, a wedding song. My heart is stirred by a noble theme as I recite my verses for the king. My tongue is the pen of a skillful writer. You are the most excellent of men, and your lips have been anointed with grace, since God has blessed you forever. Gird your sword on your side, you mighty one. Clothe yourself with splendor and majesty. In your majesty, ride forth victoriously in the cause of truth, humility, and justice. Let your right hand achieve awesome deeds. Let your sharp arrows pierce the hearts of the king's enemies. Let the nations fall beneath your feet. Your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. A scepter of justice will be the scepter of your kingdom. You love righteousness and hate wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. All your robes are fragrant with myrrh and aloes and cassia. From palaces adorned with ivory, the music of the strings makes you glad. Daughters of kings are among your honoured women. At your right hand is the royal bride in gold of Ophir. Listen, daughter, and pay careful attention. Forget your people and your father's house. Let the king be enthralled by your beauty. Honour him, for he is your lord. The city of Tyre will come with a gift. People of wealth will seek your favour. All glorious is the princess within her chamber. Her gown is interwoven with gold. In embroidered garments, she is led to the king. Her virgin companions follow her, those brought to be with her. Led in with joy and gladness, they enter the palace of the king. Your sons will take the place of your fathers. You will make them princes throughout the land. I will perpetuate your memory through all generations. Therefore, the nations will praise you forever and ever. Hi, my name's Catherine, and I'm going to be reading today from Hebrews chapter 1, starting at verse 1. To Hebrews chapter 2, finishing at verse 4. Hebrews chapter 1, starting at verse 1. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I have become your father. Or again, I will be his father and he will be my son. And again, when God brings his firstborn into the world, he says, Let all God's angels worship him. In speaking of the angels, he says, He makes his angels spirits and his servants flames of fire. But about the sun, he says, Your throne, O God, will 
last forever and ever. A scepter of justice will be the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. He also says, In the beginning, Lord, you lay the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment. You will roll them up like a robe, like a garment they will be changed. But you remain the same, and your years will never end. To which of the angels did God ever say, Sit at my right hand, until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Are not all angels ministering spirits and sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? We must pay the most careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard, so that we do not drift away. For since the message spoken through the angels was binding, and every violation and disobedience received its just punishment, how shall we escape if we ignore so great a salvation? This salvation, which was first announced by the Lord, was confirmed to us by those who heard him. God also testified to it by signs, wonders and various miracles, and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. Good morning, friends. It's great to be with you in a different way this morning. And you'll see my background is a bit different. So this is me at work. And uh, I'm going to pray before we hear God's word. Our Heavenly Father, please help us to see Jesus. Amen. I can feel myself starting to drift Do you know what I mean? It's such a strange artificial time at the moment, isn't it? This pandemic lockdown, because so many of the normal structures of our lives have been changed or postponed, and I'm starting to drift. A bit like being on a long holiday where you forget about your normal routines. Have you felt that? I'm one of the lucky ones. I'm still able to go to my place of work. I catch the train from Epping Station to work, but there's no one on it. Sometimes I am the only person in my carriage in peak hour. Or maybe one other passenger. I get to work at SNBC. Almost everyone is working from home. The students are not on campus. There's no morning tea. There's no lunchtime to mark the passing of the day. All, all my time cues have gone. There's nothing to help me structure my time. I sit at my desk and work, but my colleagues and my students are not coming in to ask questions or discuss things or call me to meetings. I'm not seeing them in class. I brought my lunch, but I often forget to have it till about three o'clock when I start to feel really hungry. There's hardly anybody around to keep me accountable, to keep me honest. I could be getting up to almost anything. And no one would know. I'm unmonitored. Even church. I'm here online with you, but I can't tell if you're there with me or not. It's been so good to be able to keep doing church as we sit in different places, to keep hearing the Bible preached by leaders we trust and love. And the children's spots are brilliant. Great stuff. Gordy, chattering tennis balls. Children praying beautifully for us, the Warner Minstrel Show, Miss Briney's Memory Verse. We're apart, but we're together. But it's not the same as real life, is it? It's just not like church face to face. It's a bit like being in a dinghy, still tied securely to the wharf, but tied by a long rope that stretches across the water. And there's a breeze blowing. I feel as though I'm drifting. And just so did the Christians feel to whom the writer of Hebrews addressed his letter. We don't know for sure who wrote this letter or when it was written. But from the letter, we do know something about the Christians, probably Jewish Christians, that it was written and sent to. They were drifting. 
They were under pressure. They were probably a bit disillusioned. They were struggling with their faith. They were in danger of giving up. And it seems they were asking, as most of us do sometimes, whether pressing on with living for Jesus was really worthwhile, whether it was really worth all the trouble, all the effort it caused them. It seems they were looking back towards their old Jewish ways and being tempted to drift back that way. Perhaps they felt they'd known where they stood with their old Jewish faith. It was so solid and stable. Look at verse 1. God had spoken through prophets. He had spoken through angels. Through Israel's history. Through the Jewish festivals. Through the law. Through sacrifices. There was security in that traditional religious community. They knew where they stood with the law. And that truly, that brought them a sense of fulfilment and peace and solidarity. And then Jesus came. And it was said that he was the Messiah God had spoken about for so long. Wonderful. They had trusted him with their lives. But still there was that backward look. The seed of doubt. The slightly troubling uncertainty. Life was not easy being Jesus' followers. And they needed reassurance that they really were thinking and doing and believing the right thing and following the right master. Because if you leave your old life behind you and stake your new life on something, you want to be absolutely sure of it. Absolutely sure of him. Because if you're sure, then you can cope with the pressures and the trials and the persecution. And that is why the writer of Hebrews begins not by scolding or criticising his readers, but by giving them a fresh vision of Jesus. He wants them to see Jesus, because it's only when we see Jesus as he really is and let him fill our horizons and sharpen our priorities that things come together to make sense of life. And so, then, he can deliver his warning. As chapter 2 begins, don't drift. In the first four verses of chapter 1 of Hebrews, the message is so clear, and the key word is striking. The key word? Superior. And the message? Jesus is superior. He was God's son. God spoke through him in a way that he'd never spoken through any prophet who'd lived, a better way. He created the universe, in verse 3, through Jesus. In verse 3 again, he's the exact representation of God's being. He's the unmistakable stamp of God's character. He wasn't just a fragment of the truth. He didn't just speak the truth, he was the truth. In Jesus, God displayed not a part of himself, but all of himself. And he made purification for sins, in verse 4 you'll see, and then sat down, because he'd finished his work completely and finally, not like the Old Testament high priests who continually stood to make their sin offerings, because their work was never finished, so they couldn't sit down. And because these discouraged and weary Christians had a Jewish background, the writer of the letter spends the rest of chapter 1 using quotations from the Old Testament, their Bible, which they knew and loved, to remind them how infinitely superior Jesus is. In verses 5 and 6, He says, Jesus is the son they worship. Angels are great servants of God, but only servants. Make no mistake, the role of angels is to worship Jesus. In verses 7 to 9, Jesus is the king they serve. We read Psalm 45, a great psalm about the king and the glory and honour that's given to the king. And he quotes it here, Psalm 45. 
Jesus is the king they serve. Compared to him, angels are mere messengers. But Jesus is God, the anointed king, who rules forever. In verses 10 to 12, Jesus is the creator of the universe. The earth will pass away. This disintegrating world that is groaning even now, isn't it, will come to an end. And angels are finite and fading. But Jesus, the one who created everything, will go on forever. And in verses 13 to 14, Jesus is the Lord they bow down to and obey. He sits down, but angels are sent out as messengers to serve us. What is this angels thing? Angels were considered very highly by the Jews. They surrounded God's throne. They delivered his messages. They guarded. Sometimes they destroyed. And sometimes they intervened in history. Angels were holy and served as God's ambassadors. But no angel was ever invited to sit at God's right hand, like the sun in verse 13. Jesus is the son they worship. Jesus is the king they serve. Jesus is the creator of the universe. Jesus is the Lord they bow down to and obey. As these Hebrew Christians, these Jewish Christians saw Jesus, and as we see Jesus immeasurably superior, we need to ask ourselves the question, is Jesus the son that I worship? Is Jesus the king I serve? Is he the creator I admire? And is he the Lord I obey and bow down to? Well, that's interesting and wonderful theology, isn't it? But where does the writer of Hebrews go next? What does he do with that? After showing these discouraged, weary Christians how superior Jesus, the Son, is to angels, where does the rubber of this theology hit the road for normal people? He goes straight for the throat, straight to a serious warning at the beginning of chapter 2. Have you noticed how the Bible is full of warnings? Why is that? It's because God loves his people and he loves his world. So he warns us about the dangers of disobeying him and neglecting him, the danger of drifting. If we do, he says, there are serious consequences. So don't do it. Don't drift away. Have you ever come across people who don't listen to warnings? They're frustrating, aren't they? Maybe you're one of them. A man called Lord Lister, whose name, real name was Duncan Sanders, was a UK parliamentarian. He was the UK Minister of Aviation in 1959 and 1960. And he was apparently quite an irritable man. On one occasion, as part of his duties, he had to fly from Liverpool to Southampton. And since he had a pilot's licence himself, he insisted on flying his own plane. The only plane available was a seaplane, and a flight lieutenant accompanied him on the journey. And as Lord Lister was getting perilously close to Southampton Airport, the landing runway, the flight lieutenant, seeing what was coming, summoned up all his courage and said, "Uh, you do remember, sir, don't you, that this is a seaplane? At that point, Lord Lister, furiously annoyed, turned away from the airstrip and landed the seaplane tolerably well on the River Solent. As he taxied up towards the jetty, he said with some sarcasm to the flight lieutenant, I do know the difference between a plane and a seaplane. Then he opened the door and stepped out into the water. Some people hate being warned. Now, some warnings you can choose to ignore. Uh, Jenny and I, years ago, were in Scotland and we were walking along a brook in a valley and we came across a sign, warning, anglers use this area. Do not walk along the pathway as there is a danger of being hooked. Well, we didn't get hooked. We didn't see any anglers. 
But other warnings you ignore to your peril, your great peril. It can be incredibly foolish to ignore some warnings. Jesus spoke some dire warnings on many occasions. Uh, Luke chapter 13, he said, Unless you repent, you will suffer an even worse fate than those people who were killed when a tower fell on them and crushed them. Luke chapter 12, Beware of hoarding wealth for yourself, he said, like that stupid, greedy profiteer who built bigger and bigger barns for his grain and his goods and then died that very night and lost everything. I used to love this sign I saw near the railway line that said, touching live wires will cause instant death. Offenders will be fined $100. I always wondered, who pays? One of the clearest and starkest warnings in the Bible is here in these first few verses of Hebrews 2. Let me read to you uh, Hebrews 2, 1 to 4. We must pay the most careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard, so that we do not drift away. For since the message spoken by angels was binding, and every violation and and disobedience received its just punishment, how shall we escape if we ignore such a great salvation? This salvation which was first announced by the Lord was confirmed to us by those who heard him. God also testified to it by signs, wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. You must not drift from this message, he says, because it's your only hope. If you drift away and ignore Jesus, what hope are you left with? So don't drift. And you'll notice that whoever wrote this is a realist. He includes himself in this warning. We must pay more careful attention so that we do not drift away. How shall we escape if we ignore such a great salvation? You see, to these Christians tempted to drift and give up, he lays down what the cost of disobedience is. Just like God's Old Testament people, God spoke to them clearly and said if they didn't keep that word of his, then punishment awaited them. Now, says the Hebrews writer in chapter 1, God's supreme and superior and final word has come, his only son, Jesus. He alone brings forgiveness from our rebellion against God. He alone brings purification for sins in chapter 1, verse 3. He alone brings salvation the promise of eternal life. So if you don't listen to him, what hope have you got? If we ignore him, we have nowhere else to turn. And in chapter 2, verses 2 to 4, he tells the readers that there's a stack of evidence that this is true. In verse 2, it was spoken by angels. In verse 3, it was announced by the Lord, by Jesus himself. It was confirmed as true by those who heard him, the apostles, the disciples, his friends who lived with him and heard him and watched his life. And they passed their eyewitness information on to us. And in verse 4 he says, it was attested by signs and miracles. They saw him stopping destructive storms. They saw him rescue a demon-possessed man. They saw him provide food for 5,000 plus people from nothing. They saw him heal people who'd been paralysed for 30 or 40 years, their whole lives. And they watched him raise dead people to life. A dead boy, a little girl, and a man, Lazarus, who'd been dead long enough to begin rotting and smelling foul. Incredible. And finally... They'd seen God raise Jesus from death, proof that this man was Lord over death and God's Messiah. And on top of all that evidence, in verse 3, there's the great salvation he achieved for us on the cross by giving his only son God's mighty rescue mission. Yes, there is a warning for punishment for disobedience in verse 2. And when people complain about God punishing, which they often do, they forget that God has done everything 
so that we don't have to face that punishment. He's given us the Bible. He's given us warnings. He's provided people to speak the truth to us, to help us see the truth. So if any of us has to face eternal consequences for rejecting Christ, that's our decision. We only have ourselves to blame. Don't drift away, God says so clearly to us. But notice that in verse 3, the writer doesn't say if we reject this great salvation, but if we ignore it. Because ignoring causes us to drift, like a boat tied loosely to a jetty, and all's well until a storm comes and loosens the rope and it drifts. Not an outright rejection, but a gradual, imperceptible, often unconscious drifting away. Lots of people like that, aren't there? You've seen it happen to friends, maybe family members. Not exactly rejecting Christ outright, but not choosing him either. Sitting on the fence and drifting along. Fine. But the Hebrews writer says, that's not true. If we drift along, we'll drift away, never towards him. Not choosing Christ is, in effect, ignoring him and his great salvation. And if we persist in ignoring it, keep putting it aside, a time will come when it's just too late. There is simply no one that compares with Jesus. Trust him, urges the writer. Don't drift. Trust Jesus. Go with him. If you're a Christian and you're drifting away from Christian faith, away from Christ, where are you going to go? There is nowhere else. Turn back to him and fill your vision with Jesus. Warning. Pay attention. Don't drift. If you're not a Christian, if you've never trusted him, do it. God's warning here is very clear. Don't ignore him. Don't dismiss the evidence. Don't just put it aside. That's so dangerous. How do we guard against drifting? We're all prone to it. Well, we need people around us, don't we? That's a bit hard at the moment. By Hebrews 10 verse 24, the writer says, Don't give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. We keep each other from drifting. Like those early Christians who received this letter, we need our church family getting together, sharing life, praying, chatting, encouraging us, calling us to account. Especially if we live by ourselves or work by ourselves or just spend lots of time on our own. We need God's warnings. That's how God makes sure we keep trusting him and Hebrews is full of them. Look again at the beginning of chapter 2. Make sure we pay attention to what we've heard. Don't drift away. Verse 2, don't forget there's a judgment, an accounting coming for all of us. Take it seriously. But remember that Jesus, the Son, has purified us from our sins. And he's done it completely, completely for those who trust him. He's even sat down because the job is finished. There's nothing more he needs to do. Or verse 3 in chapter 2, make sure we don't ignore this great salvation. How could you ignore it? But we all know people who have and who do. Don't grow weary and complacent and give up because there is no one in all space and time who compares with Jesus. And to drift away from him is the biggest and most dangerous risk anyone could take. Jesus is the son we worship. He's the king we serve. He's the creator we admire and are astonished by and give thanks to. And he's the Lord we bow down to and obey. Turn your back on Jesus and you turn your back on life itself. But for most of us, the biggest danger is not deciding to reject Jesus, but to begin to drift away from him. And you don't decide to drift, it just happens, gradually, quietly.
quietly, unconsciously, unintentionally, like the Hebrew Christians. And it can happen to us, can't it? Warning, we must pay attention, says the writer, so that we do not drift away. It can happen to any of us when we take our eyes off Jesus. Keep your eyes out for others too, especially at a time like this. We need God's people around us. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, Christ on the lips of my brother is often stronger than Christ in my own heart. We need each other to keep us from drifting. So stay tuned. Hebrews is going to help us see him. Jesus is the perfectly focused picture of God. If your idea of God, if your picture of God doesn't tally with what Jesus said or did, with what the writer of the Hebrews reminds us of, then you need to look at him again and refocus the camera of your mind and your heart. Let's pray that we do that. Thank you, our Father, for such a great salvation. Give us your spirit to keep us from drifting. Help us to refocus, to see Jesus. Fill our vision with him. Keep us from drifting, please, by your Holy Spirit. And we pray in the name of Jesus, the Son we worship, the King we serve, the Creator we admire, and the Lord we bow down to and obey. Amen. In response to what we've heard, we're going to sing. Our next song is going to be led for us by Adam Garth and Nathan Carr from All Saints Night Church. And this song's an opportunity to nail our colours to the mast and declare that our hope is in the man who is the exact representation of God's being, in the one who sustains all things by his powerful word, in the one who provided purification for sins and who now sits at God's right hand. Let's sing. Alone. 
we come now to a time of prayer, we're going to begin our prayers by confessing our sins, by being honest with God about our failures to live his way. I'm going to pray in some short sections. I'll finish each section by saying, we need your mercy. And you can join in with the words, Father, forgive us. Let's come before our merciful God now. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, you are merciful and kind, but we have often gone our own way. We need your mercy. Father, forgive us. Lord, in these last days, you have spoken to us by your Son, but too often we are slow to listen. We need your mercy. Father, forgive us. Lord, you have made Jesus heir over all things. You've seated him at your right hand on high. But too often we assume that we are in charge of our own lives. We need your mercy. Father, forgive us. Lord God, you have loved us in such a costly way. But too often we fail to love you in return. And we fail to love the people around us. We need your mercy. Father, forgive us. Lord, we repent and we're sorry for all our sins. For the sake of Christ who died for us, please cleanse us and change us. We need your mercy. Father, forgive us. All this we pray, confident in your faithfulness and love. Amen. The Bible tells us that the Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. Brothers and sisters, if you've just confessed your sins, then know that God has forgiven you because Christ died for you. And as people who are reconciled to God through Jesus, we can bring to him confidently all our cares and concerns. And Christine Olive is now going to lead us in further prayers. Please join me as we pray for our world, our nation and our community. At the end of each section, I will say, Lord, in your mercy, and you can respond. Hear our prayer. Almighty God, we praise you for your creation and all you have so generously provided. We acknowledge the responsibility you have given us to care for your creation in sustainable ways for the sake of all your people. Give us diligence in this task. Guide the leaders of all nations to seek justice and use truth in all their words and actions. Give them a compassionate heart and suitable solutions for those in need in their countries, states and territories. We particularly remember the people of Nigeria, a country divided with Christianity dominant in the south and Islam dominant in the north. We grieve for our brethren who are the victims of violent attacks, leading to the loss of life, physical injury and destruction of property. We are particularly mindful of the girls and women who were kidnapped during these raids and of the denial of access to education for young Christian believers. Help them to stand firm, Lord, in the face of these unjust attacks. Give grace, peace and healing as they deal with the threat of violence. Give them strength to withstand the pressure and enable them to respond to persecution in a way that glorifies Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We bring to you, Lord, our concerns for the impact of the coronavirus on our world and on our country and on our community. Give wisdom to our various levels of government in Australia in their decision making and to all of us as we adjust to the social changes to which we are asked to adhere. We thank you for the dedication of health workers and commit their safety to you. Be with those impacted financially by the economic downturn. As people work through this time of uncertainty, may they turn to you and find eternal security in Christ. We thank you, Lord, for those who have come to assist with the coronavirus cluster at Newmarch House. 
as the staff continue to work through this very difficult situation. Sustain them and give patience to the families of the residents impacted by this outbreak. We ask that staff and families find comfort and strength in you, Lord. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We thank you, Lord, for the technology that is linking us week by week while we are unable to meet physically. We thank you for the encouragement of music and your word and conversations with friends. We thank you that we can still pray together for one another. We remember Alison and her family following the death of her mother, Lisa and her family following the death of her mother, and the friends of Ken. Comfort them in their grief and give them assurance of your love for them. Keep mums and babies safe at this time. We thank you for our post-HSC students who are spending a year involved with Year 13 at YouthWorks or the bridge at SMBC and ask that they will be strengthened in their relationship with you and in their sense of purpose for the future. We commit to you this week the Wade and Warner families. Sustain and encourage them, Lord, as they seek to honour you in their families. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Amen. There's some late-breaking news that we're going to add on to the prayer time here. On Thursday, Matt and Rachel welcomed their new twins, Oliver and Genevieve. Uh, so I'm going to pray for those guys now. Father God, uh, we want to thank you for this good gift that you've given to Matt and Rachel and Sophie and Charlie uh, of a new son and daughter, a new brother and sister. Father, we've been asking you to look after this family and we thank you so much that you've answered our prayers and that these two precious little ones have arrived in the world safely and smoothly. Father, we ask that you'd strengthen Matt and Rachel uh, as they take on two new children to care for, give them energy and strength and the support from others that they need. Uh, and we pray for Charlie and Sophie as they adjust to having an extra brother and sister all at once. Father, thank you for your care for us and we ask that you continue to care for this family. Amen. As we finish our time of prayer, let's pray together the Lord's Prayer in which we look ahead to the day when Jesus returns and we entrust ourselves to God's care in the meantime. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Well, we're nearly at the end of our service, but as well as this organised part of church, it's important that we do the informal part of talking to each other and encouraging one another. Some of our small groups have formed the habit of getting together on Zoom after church on a Sunday. Uh, and so you might like to do that if uh, you're in one of the small groups. If not, you're welcome to join in our online morning tea at uh, allsaintsepping.org slash morning tea. Uh, this is a Zoom meeting. Uh, this Zoom meeting has the waiting room turned on because the internet is not always a good place. Uh, so after you click to join the meeting, do just wait a couple of minutes and someone will let you in. If Zoom isn't your thing, uh, it'd be great to give someone a ring on the phone now, uh, see how they're going, have a chat about church this morning. Don't forget that the Anglicare food collection is underway. Outside the side door of church is the red collection bin where you can contribute uh, non-perishable food that Anglicare would be very happy to distribute to people around Sydney who are doing it tough in the coronavirus era. Uh, while you're there, you can also pick up a printed copy of the Bible study guide if you'd like to. Let's sing our final song. As Christians, we are not our own. We were bought at a price. We belong to Jesus and our future is secure in him. This 
life I live is not my own, for my Redeemer paid the price. He took it to be His alone, to be His treasure and His prize. The things of earth I leave behind to live in worship of my King. His is the Thanks for joining in with All Saints Connect today. If you're on Facebook, please do leave a comment and say hello. Don't forget about Zoom morning tea, and I hope you have a great week. Brothers and sisters, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. Sound of love.